we had always sought to get the uh, presidential candidates to debate. And the uh, uh, convention of 1960, as soon as the candidates had been selected, uh, Bob Sarnoff, uh, Bob Kettner, uh, Bill McAndrew and I sat in a hotel room in Chicago and composed a telegram to the two uh, candidates, urging them to, to do this. I guess the other networks were doing the same thing at the same time. And uh, I know that the candidates themselves had probably uh, been thinking about it long before we were, probably. And uh, uh, so reluctantly, uh, they agreed upon the debates. And they certainly were historic, and they certainly were influential in the outcome of the election. And the debates have changed a great deal since then, if indeed uh, they have been debates. but. The ones we had then <clears throat> were, in, were, were the real thing, and they may have changed the course of history uh, because they were on television, because people got a chance to see the candidates and a chance to uh, choose for themselves which man they wanted to, to lead them. It is, uh, it's difficult that the mechanics and uh, the cosmetics of the situation have blurred over the years uh, who was the best man for the job because the final final vote was less than half a million and uh, television did play a, a very important part in making the making the decision or allowing the American people to make the decision for themselves. The impact of the first debate um, has been well reported. Uh, how did you um, try to uh, cover and maintain a fair balance of the coverage of the second debate? Well, the rules had already been laid out pretty well by agreement of the candidates and uh, meeting various meetings with them. <coughs> uh, and so it wasn't any real problem because the, uh, we, we did everything we could that we normally would in the course of our news coverage to keep it fair and equitable. But the rules had been agreed to by the candidates as to who the people would be and uh, what uh, number of minutes they would have allotted for debate, for questions, and counter questions. So there were no, we didn't have to Im impose some extra things. But in the terms of the studio facilities, uh, we did maintain, uh, I selected as a director Frank Slingland, who had been a director of uh, Meet the Press, S L I N G L A N D, a very good director. He was our top director in Washington at the time, and very even-tempered young man, and he, he did an excellent job doing it. Our lighting directors were, were all excellent and our, our uh, technical people. And we, Frank Slegland and I agreed that we would keep the studio at a 70 degree temperature. It seems fair enough. It's 70 right here, right now. Uh, in order to do that, in order to make sure that when the television lights came on, the temperature would be 70. Uh, we ascertained that we would have to cool the studio during the daytime and bring it up when the lights come up, came up. But when Leonard Wrench, R-E-I-N-S-C-H, the former Cox Broadcasting Executive, or perhaps even then doing the same job, who was advisor to uh, Kennedy at the White House, Leonard Wrench came in and felt it was cool and thought we were going to have it that cold during the, <clears throat> during the next debate because uh, it was obvious that Nixon had been sweating during the first one and Kennedy had not. And Wrench was of the opinion that we were doing this to favor Nixon, which we were not. We were trying to be equable and uh, treat each one in the same way. But he got the uh, uh, air conditioning man out of his room and made him come up and tried to get him to change the air conditioning. But we dissuaded him from doing, in the, doing that. It was a very tense time, and you can understand why. Bobby Kennedy was in the control room saying, that picture doesn't look good coming in, but we're saying it's, but it's coming from, it's going several places and coming back. You can't, that's not the picture going out of here. And uh, <clears throat> Jack Kennedy came on the set and said, that light over there is shining directly in my eyes and not in Mr. Nixon's eyes. 
And <clears throat> I went up and I sat there and I said, no, sir, the light is, is fair for both of you. It's in the exactly the right place. And the man who had spent three days fixing these lights came up to me with tears in his eyes and said, thanks. But they were, they were treated right. They were just all nervous <clears throat> and tense. And you could understand it because the presidency hung upon the, the next words. 